it is not weird or crazy for someone to ask what the actual value of their vote is. And having someone from your campaign or from your community who can answer that question honestly and the audience member, the person, the target has a relationship with that person. So my neighbor, my friend, my sorority sister, my cousin, my brother, right? Increases the likelihood that A, not only am I gonna get information that I can rely on, right? But also B, it's information that I'm much more likely to take action on. Hello and greetings to everyone. I'm James Johnson, and I serve as the marketing graphic designer here at NDTC. We're about to get started, guys. <laughs> but first, we just want to just thank you. Thank you so much for your interest in this training. And also, if this is helpful, please like and subscribe, as well as sign up for more free, and I do mean absolutely free, expert-led trainings at traindemocrats.org. Again, traindemocrats.org. Also, feel free to just leave a comment with your key takeaways because we really love, I mean love and appreciate your feedback. And with that being said, I just hope you all enjoy today's training. Thank you, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to today's Bill Blue question and answer session on relational organizing. As the session of the Build Blue Week, where the National Democratic Training Committee is building the knowledge infrastructure, capacity, and resources for strategic wins for Democrats in the future. Today, I will be your host and moderator. My name is Y.T. Nika, Y.T. Bell. I'm the National Organizing Director at Karen Action. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and we have some phenomenal um, panelists and guests today. Uh, I'm gonna go down the list and introduce everyone. Uh, and if everybody will just give a brief overview of who you are, uh, and what brings you to this work, that would be great. Um, so super excited to have you all here. So thank you for everybody um, that's attending as well as our esteemed guests. I will start with Greta Corns. Um, She's a former national organizing director for Pete for America. Pronouns are she and her. And I will give Greta a second to introduce herself to everybody. Hey everyone, I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, and talk relational organizing, um, especially heading into the 2021 and 2022 cycles. Um, I was running a big relational program for Mayor Pete for his presidential, um, and we did a lot of things. We learned a lot. We did a lot right. We did a lot wrong, um, but I'm really excited to watch this sort of new and old tactic um, emerge and be adopted at a much bigger scale. Thank you, Greta. Thank you for being here. Uh, next panelist and guest is Monique Alcala. Um, she's the former coalition director um, in Virginia for Biden for president. Uh, her pronouns are she and her. Monique? Hi, everyone. I'm also equally excited to be here um, amongst all of you today. Um, I'm getting a lot of anxiety coming to you live from Texas, but uh, I've been working on campaigns for over a decade now. I got my start in uh, the fifth CD in Virginia, um, but over the years, my career has really been centered around power building, lifting up historically excluded communities. Um, and last year I worked for the Biden-Harris campaign as a coalitions director where me and my wonderful team um, and also props to the folks from the political comms, digi, data and field departments where we all work together to achieve our 10 point victory out in the Commonwealth. So I'm excited to be here today to just share some of the knowledge and experience that I've, um, that I've uh, learned over the, over the years. Thank you so much, Monique. And and our final guest is Insu, I'm sorry, Inse Yufa. I know how to say her name. I say it all the time. So sorry about that. The correction is Inse Yufa. Um, she's the CEO of the National Georgia Project. Her pronouns are she, her, and shawty. Inse? Hi, peace everyone. Um, so yeah, Inse Yufa, uh, chief bottle washer, um, beggar in chief, train conductor at the New Georgia Project. Um, we're probably best known um, as a group that does a lot of large scale voter registration. To date, we've helped almost 600,000 young people and people of color register to vote in all 159 of Georgia's counties. But we're actually really a tech 
startup inside of a civil rights and movement building, empower building organization. We build video games, we build apps, we leverage technology and all of our relationships to build power for working people and for people of color. Um, and I am coming to you uh, today from my home office in Atlanta, um, unceded Muscogee territory. So uh, super pumped to be here with you all today. Thank you so much, Insay. So welcome again for those that are just joining us. Thank you for coming um, today to be a part of our Build Blue Week, um, where we're going to ask some questions and have a question and answer session around relational organizing. Uh, as most of you heard across the country, relational or organizing became like a campaign buzzword in 2020 election. Uh, and for good reason, right? Uh, if you use it well, it actually works for you. Um, and so today we have these experts that have worked on campaigns in various states and across the country to kind of give us insight on how we can do better when it comes to relation organizing or what is a more effective way of utilizing it um, to ensure that we have future wins as Democrats. And so relational organizing is a key component for building year-round infrastructure um, with building blue communities as part of this Build Blue Week. Um, today, I'm going to ask a series of questions. Um, the panelists will respond, and then we'll also have a moment at the end for uh, questions from attendees. So without further ado, um, if you have a question, I want to prompt all of the attendees to type your questions in the question and answer chat box. Um, please uh, do those now and we'll compile those and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible um, throughout today's question and answer session on relational organizing. So without further ado, I'll ask the first question. The first question, and we'll go in alphabetical order, um, according to the last name or however y'all choose as panelists, we're just excited y'all are here with us. So go in as whatever order you choose. Um, but the first question is relational organizing, as I mentioned, became this word or this term that was used a lot uh, in 2020 uh, in the elections. But why is it so powerful? Who would like to go first? I can, I can go. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, actually, I don't know if I should go first. I kind of am going to be the Debbie Downer, I think. But maybe some of y'all can like lift up the spirits. Um, but I do think that relational organizing is pretty powerful right now because um, trust in institutions is kind of sitting at historic lows, right? Poll after poll kind of illustrates like uh, kind of an unnerving picture where we have like 50% of Americans um, that they don't trust the government. And so we see, and we see that number declining um, year after year for several reasons, which I definitely won't go into today. But if you do, and it's interesting because if you look closer at the data, um, er, er, things get a little bit um, more optimistic. Um, and actually, I think it sets some context for our conversation today because it talks, it shows the power of localized networks and functionally how this type of organizing works. Because when you zoom in, trust in our institutions actually increases as we get closer to home. And so what, I guess, what do I mean by that is, um, is that right now, for example, trust in Congress, it's at about a um, little less than uh, 40%. Um, it usually hovers around like 30 something percent in the high 30s. Um, and then trust in our electoral system is, is sits uh, definitely below 50%, about 48 or something. But whenever you get to state and local uh, levels, that, that trust barrier like breaks um, the 50% threshold where you, know, you have state and local government hovering at about 53 and 58% respectively. So this is gonna vary of course um, across the country, but this actually makes a lot of intuitive sense because if you think about your early civics classes um, where your teachers have you participate in these exercises, which my daughter just did recently, um, to evaluate who you go to for your political and cultural knowledge. Like these are our trusted networks that we've developed over the years. And so similarly, as you get to more localized electoral politics, like you just like know these people. And so operationally, I think like relational organizing sort of operate or is built on a couple of assumptions. And so uh, number one, like trust in democratic institutions is in fact eroding um, and that to uh, trust in these networks is, or, or these validators is actually a powerful mechanism for leveraging power, empowering these communities and also mobilizing these communities. And then three, it also assumes that the political ecosystem is just full of a ton of information. We're a lot more connected than we were before. And so it, it's, it's a good way to sort of break through the noise and sort of close the knowledge gaps on how we get people activated, mobilized and out to vote. 
And th right now, it's particularly, you know, I, I said earlier today that I'm, I'm sitting here in Texas, um, like we're sitting at a very important historical moment. Um, we have lots of um, voter suppression laws that are that have been going through. I just had my rights rolled back as a, as a woman um, in my reproductive rights access. Um, and so our fundamental rights are, um, are being aggressively uh, attacked. And so, and, and specifically we're talking about communities um, of the new American majority voters. So these are voters of color, LGBTQIA voters, community, uh, women, immigrants, and youth. So what this, um, what relational organizing does um, is it, it thinks about like the, the experiences that all these communities have had um, and the, this uh, is, is important because the, these communities have had like intentional disenfranchisement, um, systemic oppression, and institutionalized racism and sexism. So um, trust in the system is just not really there. And so it, um, it, uh, it so this is a particularly interesting way for us to like sort of tap into these networks. So we have these built-in validators, presumably people that we trust um, that have like some sort of history. And so from a tactical perspective, it's a lot easier for someone to apply social pressure, encourage them to vote. We also see higher contact rates with um, with relational organizing because I mean, who wants to answer a stranger's call? Um, it's a lot easier to like uh, reach out whenever it's somebody that you know. So again, relational organizing just sort of gives us an opportunity to tap into these networks of trust and like leverage that power. Thank you, Monique. Uh, Insa, you want to go next? Yeah. Um... Uh, everything Monique said. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'll add this. Um, we are witnessing and living through sort of maybe not unprecedented, but really, really sort of new. Actually, they are kind of unprecedented given the format. An unprecedented attack on our, demo our democracy itself our democratic institutions um, and the places and spaces where people go to get information. And it's designed to destabilize our government because as these Cold War tactics, um, they're cheaper and they're equally as impactful as hot war tactics. And we used to see it with just bad actors who are foreign, foreign entities, right? Um, but in this moment, we're witnessing bad actors who are both foreign and domestic attempt to poison the information wells, discourage people from participating in our democracy and getting people to withdraw from public life, period, right? And how we've been able to push back against that and fight back against that um, is by focusing aggressively on digital media literacy, right? Because what we're learning is that Gen Z and the younger um, and basically boomers and older are particularly vulnerable for misinformation that comes through social media um, for very different reasons. One, because they're digital natives, if you will, and the other because they're not. Um, and I say all of that as a, an attempt to set a context because we are working to register voters and educate voters and make sure that voters are competent and move voters to action in an environment where they don't know who to trust, where whether or not the information that's coming to them um, is something that they can rely on. And also where some have had the experience of voting for people that said that they were gonna do one thing and then they ended up not doing it. And so, it is not weird or crazy for someone to ask what the actual value of their vote is, right? What the actual value of their contribution is. And having someone from your campaign or from your community who can answer that question honestly and the audience member, the person, the target, has a relationship with that person. So my neighbor, my friend, my sorority sister, my cousin, my brother, right? Increases the likelihood that A, not only am I gonna get information that I can rely on, 
right? But also B, it's information that I'm much more likely to take action on, right? And so if you are a campaign, a partisan campaign that's trying to get people to vote for you in this moment right now, right? And those, there's a short-term sort of gain or a short-term goal that you're trying to accomplish, or if you are a power building and movement building organization like ours at the New Georgia Project, that it's still the same, right? That we have to be aware of the waters in which we swim and the things that are keeping our folks, our target, our audience from taking the action that we need them to take um, and figuring out what are the best, smartest, most ethical, most efficient, cheapest ways in order to do that and relying on the built-in networks, the trusted networks, the relationships of your leaders and your staff and your super volunteers and your donors is a quick and easy, efficient and proven way um, to make sure that you're getting your stickiest message to your audience and that people are taking action and can rely on that action. And I, the thing I always think about is um, there's always cute stuff being advertised to me in my Instagram feed and in my Facebook feed, but I have been burned so many times by fake online retailers that I refuse. The only time I'm going to buy your cute jeggings is if I know a human being who has also bought something from you and it actually came because I have had the personal experience of having my money taken by really cute photos constantly being advertised to me on my Facebook feed. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Inse. Uh, Greta, you want to chime in? I mean, everything they both said was right. And I think, um, I came at relation, but I've only worked in campaigns for 10 years. Like I, I don't, I have never worked outside of campaigns. Um, and so what, you know, I think I really approached relational from the lens of, you know, just the electoral, like short-term, how are we building something very quick? And, you know, we're really good at burning stuff to the ground and that is bad. And I think it took me a really long time to sort of figure out, like, first of all, democratic campaigns are the last door-to-door -door salesmen in the world. Like, you know, in we don't sell things door to door anymore. And it's because it doesn't really work, you know, and we are not adopting at scale the things that we know work, you know, and everything that both of you said, like, you know, we trust our friends and family so much more than we trust a stranger at our door. We don't pick up our phones when people call anymore, especially if it's an unknown number. And so how are you figuring out how to scale that tactically to win? But then I also think it really is such a better reflection of our values as a party to push power down and empower people to talk to their own networks and friends and family, partially because strategically it lasts a lot longer than post an election day. You know, I always want to think about one of the most critical times to talk to people is the week or two after an election. You know, how are we talking to people then? How are we making sure that our, you know, we're doing outreach to the people who voted against us so that the next time we can convince them to join us. How are we having an earnest conversation about you know, what Democrats are doing to help people in immediately after an election happens? Um, and we don't do that because campaigns evaporate. Um, and I think you know, we also have turned campaign volunteering, or I think in some cases more broadly, you know, volunteering overall. But you know, I think especially on campaigns, we're we're bad at turning volunteering into come in and make you know, the phone calls that we tell you to make to the people we've deigned from a voter file or from a, you know, magic voter model that we've decided are the voters we need to talk to. We need you to call those people. We need you to have conversations with them. And that's your job in this. But we don't actually empower them. We don't empower them to organize their own communities. We don't empower them to actually, you know, organize past the date that an organizer leaves. We don't tell them how to build their own networks. You know, none, I was an organizer first in 2012 for Barack Obama in Iowa. And I know that when I left, my volunteers wouldn't have been able to keep doing the work because I didn't teach them how, because I just said, knock doors and make phone calls and don't question what I'm telling you. This is what they've told me works. And, you know, especially in the last 10 years on campaigns, I think that's really changing. Um, I think especially recently it is, but I think it's changing for the better of how we organize and how we campaign for our values, wanting to push power down, wanting to empower people to start doing this work on their own without, you know, needing 500 organizers influxed into an area that they've never been before, um, telling people what to do or how to do it, or you know, telling them that there's some study from 2000 that shows that it works when we know we're not in the year 2000 anymore and things have changed. So I think that I think there's so much potential for relational that's you know it's strategic but it's also really values driven and I think that's going to help, especially in the next 
era of how we campaign. Thank you, Greta. So for those that are just joining us, that was a lot of essential information. And what I took from it is that when you think of relational organizing, you should think of transformational power building. And one of the things that was mentioned uh, in the first question is that it's not a one-off situation, right? If you want to create transformation, then it has to be ongoing. You have to assess folks. You have to understand your community and who you're talking to, but you also have to know who are those trusted allies in the community that can move voters uh, as we embark on these elections in 2022. So I'll jump into the second question. Um, what are the best ways to organize your campaign team and volunteers to set up effective um, relational organizing uh, operation? Grada kind of spoke to the fact that, you know, you're told things that work and that are effective, but how do you do that from a relational organizing um, uh, operational component that is year long that really can have the impact um, that's intended? And uh, Grada, since she went last, um, would you mind going first this time? Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so again, I think it's much different for an organization that's doing this work long-term and I cannot speak to that as effectively. Um, but I think there's a couple things we should definitely mention. One is that I think right now and in the past couple of years with relational, people have been really excited about the tools or the technology or the apps. And I think that plays a really important role. But I also think that we need to acknowledge that a lot of volunteers don't like tools and technology and apps. Um, we spent so long on Pete's campaign trying to get people just to use a simple website and they hated it. And we found that buy-in with our volunteers was so much higher after literally just getting them started on pen and paper sitting with them, with them at a coffee shop and asking them to write down, you know, the people in their community they thought that they could talk to, their friends, their family, you know, who are the last 15 people you called? Um, and so those were better ways for us to get trust and buy-in that we weren't trying to mine their data, um, but also just a way to have them understand the mechanics of like, oh, you're literally asking me to just like text my friend right now and say like, hey, do you want to come to this event? Or like, hey, can I talk to you about something? Um, and that was really helpful for us. But I also think it's important that we don't, you know, we have to find the lowest, the way that relational is really effective is when you reach communities that are really difficult to reach otherwise. We can't just have activists doing the work because activists are likely already talking to, you know, their friends and family about these issues. Like we have to make sure as many people as possible are talking to their friends and family. And so that means finding the lowest bar to entry. And so I think one of the things that we found um, in terms of operationalizing was, making tech an option, but not a requirement, um, even if it was as simple as a website or if it was an app, making it, you know, a, if it was easier for you to do it on that way, great. But if it wasn't, an organizer could support that data infrastructure with you and you can just do things on pen and paper. Um, and I think the second thing that I wanna say in terms of operationalizing it is telling people over and over and over again why it's important. Um, we had a lot of people that at first were just like, you know, I'm willing to make calls, I'm willing to, you know, come in and, and knock a packet. And so we'd say, yes, like you can do those things, but like, here's why it's so important to talk to your friends and family. And I think we kind of evangelized it. And I think that helped a lot of people understand what their role was. Um, I also think that people's first assumption with it is like, I need to go to my, you know, most Trump supporting person in my life. And it's on me to convince them in one conversation to now vote for Democrats. But that's not, you know, relational is talking to everybody. It's talking to your sister who's already a Democrat about starting to get involved and starting to do more things in her own community. And, you know, it's, you know, my parents on Pete's campaign would never ever knock doors or make phone calls, but my mom was willing to like share Pete's book with everybody that she swam with and her swim group. And like, that's a form of relational organizing. And my dad would wear his boot edge shirt to Costco and talk to people at Costco. And like, there are little ways that I think they're, you know, there are stepping stones to get people more comfortable with the idea of introducing political conversation into their lives and their friend groups. Um, and so it doesn't have to be, in, you know, immediately go talk to the Republicans in your life because it's on you to convince them. And I think that's where people's heads really tend to go quickly. Thank you, Greta. Yes, sir. Um, the question is what best practices and like how to do it. Yeah, just the best way you organize your team or volunteers to set up effective relational organizing operation. Yeah, I'm pretty platform agnostic as well. Um, the truth of the matter is that the majority of people who are trying to sell me apps, I think of them as grifters. Um, 
And if you're offended, I was probably talking about you. Um, and yeah, I think that ultimately, like, it's about relationships. Um, again, I think about relational organizing in a number of contexts um, because, you know, we do electoral campaigns, but we also do issue campaigns, and then we do sort of long-term organizing. And so, you know, when I think about, I mean, for us, it's about getting people uh, to think about the communities and the networks that they are a part of, that they have influence, or that it makes sense for them to deliver a message to or make an ask of uh, for a particular goal. Um, and, and not to oversimplify it, but that is what it is. Um, and so again, if it's to get someone to vote for a particular candidate, making sure that the folks that you're organizing with have like their arm to the teeth, right? With swag and answers to tough questions and answers to frequently asked questions, um, links to additional resources, like that they have all of the things, right, that they need when they go out into their church network or into their neighborhood network or when they're into their familial network, right? Um, and then again, what is the ask? I think that, you know, because there is, and I also, we you, we cut data, we cut lists, we purchase the voter file, et cetera, that there's absolutely value in that. Um, you know, broadening our network, making sure that people hear the message from your campaign, um, that they hear messages from your candidate, that that's really important. But when it comes to relational organizing, you have very little control over the universe. And so, you should endeavor to control the things that you can, which is the message that's going out and how trained your people are and to the extent that you can, making them super confident um, in delivering the message on behalf of your campaign. And so because there's a lot of guesswork and a lot of hands-offness as it relates to the audience um, that they choose, the network that they're bringing to your campaign, um, seeking to control everything else. Um, and again, arming your volunteers and staff and organizers to the teeth with all of the things um, that they could possibly need, um, I think is super, super important. And then also I think it's accountability in both directions, right? Like acknowledging that, you know, if people are kind of circumspect about turning over their lists of friends and families to your county or state um, party, it's for a reason. Um, and so like what can be done to, uh, you know, repair that harm in the moment, um, I think is a question that we should be thinking about, but also um, if there's nothing that can be done, um, again, just being mindful that, you know, thinking about what are the ways to being, I guess, flexible in how you receive information. I live and die and erect all of our campaigns by metrics. Like that's super important to me. All of our organizers and everyone who's worked with me knows that. Call it a personality flaw, whatever, right? But what I will say is that I'm not 100% prescriptive about what those metrics are. Right. And so if you come in and you tell me like I've texted my um, entire sorority chapter and like you show the phone and we have a way that like we can reliably like put that down on a chart somewhere, I'm rolling. Right. But so metrics are very important. Um, but what those metrics are, um, you should be willing to be broader and creative in thinking about what they are based off of the people people that you are trying to bring into the work. Thank you, Insta. Uh, Monique, you want to add? 
Yeah, um, I won't add too much because I think we've covered quite a bit. Uh, thank you both. And I really appreciate both of your perspectives from you know, do, doing the uh, long-term organizing you know, within the advocacy world and also on the electoral side. You know, I think for better and for worse you know, in the electoral world where money is actually maybe for worse, when money is like a significant indicator of what type of capacity that you have in the field. Um, you know, in 2020, Biden in Virginia in particular, we had quite a bit of flexibility. And, and so when we were creating our networks of, um, uh, for coalitions, like we looked at the data and um, so that sort of informed like how we were gonna structure out our campaign on the coalition side. And so uh, like what, what communities were we going to prioritize? And so what we did was, um, and again, I, I'll just preface this with, we had a shit ton of money. Um, and so if you're working on a local race, like don't take this as gospel. Um, or if you're working on, on anything smaller than that, don't take it as gospel. But I think you know, in, 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 in terms of like setting up your infrastructure, what we did was we had things divided out by community. Uh, and so, and there are a number of reasons for that, um, just because you know, these are you know, peer to peer, you know, um, organizing is very effective as we're talking about, um, but people wanna see, you know, I, when I started working on campaigns, like, I, like there was nobody who looked like me that worked on the campaign that I was at. So people wanna see, you know, at least it's a little bit more comfortable to go into a, a space where somebody looks like you. And so that's, that's exactly what we did. I had four deputies, I had a huge team, four deputies, two fellows that managed our entire statewide effort. And so, and each of them took ownership of a community that they felt very passionate about, or they were a member of that community. And so, um, and just really quickly, just sort of like, um, it, I mean, it looked very traditional as, as far as like what, um, what campaigns typically look like. Um, so we created a space for community members where they could just go and meet other people. Um, so we, every single week we had just like a, hey, this is like a person who's like a local validator in this region, um, come like listen and hear why you wanna get involved in the campaign. Um, so just sort of like an onboarding process and then like the engagement piece, um, like you, as we're pulling people up the ladder, of, the ladder of engagement as we so call it, um, we, we also wanted to include them in conversations about, about uh, what, what Biden and Harris were, um, were, um, were um, advocating for or campaigning on. And so we created these messaging events. We had these virtual house parties. We had like little slide decks that, that, that talked about like, here's how you, um, uh, you uh, organize your own like little house party to do this sort of relational organizing in your own communities. And then like sort of the activation piece. So once you get to a certain level of sophistication or like not sophistication, but like activation within all of these communities, um, we also created an opportunity every single week for, you know, uh, I don't know, a phone bank for Latinos, a phone bank for um, Black Virginians, a phone bank for women uh, for Biden. And so all of these things um, were just things that we did just to make sure that we were doing things and meeting voters where they are. And so all of all of the, every single constituency group didn't have the same type of campaign. We all, we, we thought about this and like, we, we talked with who are the people that have been working on campaigns every single year. Um, we also included people that, you know, weren't so active and we, we got all of that information and we specifically uh, created a campaign or we created a, a plan to like, you know, um, operationalize that throughout throughout the campaign, and so um, the sort of what what Greta and Nusay were talking about earlier. Um, some people hated the Vojo app. I mean, they just hated it, and they didn't want to use it. And so that and that was fine. And so, but we did every single time we had an event, whether it was the onboarding thing, the you know sort of engagement piece or the activation piece. We always had like, oh, reach out to five more friends, bring them you know to this event or whatever. And then, um, but man, women love. Women in Virginia loved the Bojo app. It was not a problem, um, but some some people really hated it. So um, I think just sort of, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, meet people where they are, just create a, a plan that, that um, speaks to what they want to see in the campaign. Thank you, Monique. Can, oh. can I say one more thing about metrics too? Sure. Because I think this was a really interesting point and certainly something we learned a lot about when we were doing this on Pete's campaign is, you know, we threw out the metrics of like, you know, phone calls and door knocking. And we were like, well, what metrics are actually going to fuel this work? And at first we did, um, we had relational volunteers, like the number of people who were talking to their friends and family. And we just marked them with an activist code and van, but van is really not built well to be able to do relational where it is right now. And that is difficult. And so then the other metric we were thinking was we wanted to measure the number of conversations that we were having. And we just built an external report for it. And it was so difficult to implement because it was never correct because 
you know, at first we were asking volunteers to self-report conversations, which volunteers should not have to do and didn't do. And then we were saying organizers could, you know, input when volunteers were having conversations, but that was difficult because, you know, then it was like a lot of chasing, you know, who was, who was having conversations. And there was sort of like a nice entity, like part of it where organizers were then reaching out to all the people who had been having conversations the previous reporting week and saying like, all right, like, who did you talk to? But that meant that like, you know, from a national perspective, we were looking at, you know, these metrics for on the ground in, in states like Iowa. And we were like, we just know these numbers are way off, but we don't really know. You know, it's like the difference of measuring something so perfectly that doesn't win an election or doesn't actually move somebody or being able to imperfectly measure something that is actually going to be the right thing to measure. And then the last thing we measured for a little bit was we measured house meetings. Essentially, we had volunteers um, offer to have 50 people in their living room pre-COVID, um, where 50 of their friends, they invited 50 of their friends and family, and then they came in to somebody's living room and it worked really well in like, you know, especially rural districts, it worked really well in like Western Iowa. And so people would come into this living room and then they would have an organizer there and they would talk about the campaign. And at first we were setting metrics for how many people needed to be hosting these house meetings. And then eventually we took them away and our organizers were like, no, 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 put that metric back. That worked really well for us to bring in new people. That was the best way for us to figure out what we needed to do to be able to hit these goals. And so that was a really interesting thing to listen to is, you know, I think especially while we figure out what works, especially when we're trying to go against things like BAM that are really good at measuring doors and phones, but not quite the relational side yet, listening to what works and getting feedback from the people who are on the ground doing the work far and away was the best thing we did. I mean, we, I feel so terrible for our organizers. Um, some of whom are on this call that, you know, we kept changing metrics and we kept asking like, you know, sorry that we're making, we're holding you accountable to metrics that the reporting is never accurate for, but I think it ended up helping to, it, you know, have them understand why we were doing what we were doing, even if we were going to do it extremely imperfectly. Thank you, Greta. Um, so we talked a, a little bit about from that question, like the things that we know, right? We need to provide our volunteers and our teams with all the information, but we have to be cognitive of the community that we're targeting and making sure that that information resonates. So I have one last question I would like to ask the panelists and I'll ask it uh, if we can do uh, 30 seconds or less responses just so that we can go into um, the questions from our attendees. But what's the one biggest mistake that you've seen with campaigns, um, and organizations too, when they're trying to connect voters through relational organizing. Uh, Insight, would you like to go first? Um, I think that uh, candidate and partisan campaigns by nature are transactional, that you are used to pooping where you eat um, and you're used to grand opening and grand closing. Um, that you actually want something from the people and there are often times, but you try to use the rhetoric of power building and relationship and family um, and you know things that are much more um, relational uh, for something that is actually super transactional. And when they say, we don't believe you, you need more people, um, it's because ultimately people know when you are trying to say, you gave a message because you want something, right? And so I think the biggest, learning or the biggest lesson for us there is don't try to make it something that is not. Um, but like your candidate has a vision. Hopefully your candidate is from the community or from the jurisdiction or whatever. The candidate has a vision that we are hoping aligns with your vision. But like, I'm not going to pretend like, you know, I'm your friend um, or I'm your family member. It's more than 30 seconds. Like, Campaigns by de by definition are transactional. Using relational organizing will always not be like one to one and weird and interesting, but being honest about where the gaps are and like trying to bring those relationships and the power of those relationships and the trust of those relationships um, to your campaign. If you're honest about it, people will respect it and people will respond. Um, and when you're not, they'll lie to your face just to get you off their porch and off the phone. Thank you, Insay. Uh, Monique, 30 seconds will lift. If yep, 30 seconds. Um, I would say that the biggest mistake is uh, maybe just not empowering your, your voters or not empowering the, the people that you have on the ground. Uh, like relational organizing is legitimately built on the assumption of trust in, in, in the people that you are activating and that they are, you know, one, doing the work and that two, they have those relationships. 
And so uh, campaigns, they have an agenda, like, like we were saying, it's, um, it, it's very transactional. And so uh, in order to build, to keep building on, on those relationships and to like utilize those relationships in a meaningful way and not you know, force them to break their trust uh, with those communities, we have to empower them and like trust that they're gonna be doing doing the work and that they they care about the work. Everybody, you know, that does this work, sorry, that's more than 30 seconds, but um, everybody that does this work, um, that we all tend to be like mission driven, um, especially when we're doing relational organizing. It's not like, I wanna do things for the Democratic Party. It's always gonna be about uh, what can I do to like help my community? So um, understanding that is completely contradictory to what we're doing on Democratic campaigns. Thanks, Monique. No worries about the 30 seconds <laughs> for questions. Uh, Grata, you want to jump in? I think the biggest mistake from a tactical perspective is when, um, especially just with campaigns, like when you don't fully unite it with an organizing program um, or you have it try to be separate. Um, I think that is where, you know, and this is like a really narrow answer, but I think especially as I've seen campaigns in the last couple of years and where we take it into the future, I think it's when it's something separate that either organizers or volunteers are asked to do, but it's not fully centered in what, what is happening on the ground and what campaigns are prioritizing asking their folks to do. Thank you, Greta. Um, so if there's one thing that you take from the panelists today, be very intentional, ensure that you know your audience and relational organizing takes time. It's not transactional, you can't be in and out. Um, so with that, now we wanna take some questions from the audience. So if you have not done so thus far, please type in your questions in the Zoom question and answer box and I will lift those up and we'll give you a couple minutes um, to put those in the chat box. And I'm gonna start looking up ones that have already been listed and I'll um, provide those questions to the panelists and whoever wants to answer it can just jump on in uh, for the sake of time. So the first question I see in the chat box is, um, how do you respond to new misinformation that comes up in conversations with friends and family without scolding them or shaming them? Uh, they catch me off guard with random misinformation and I want to be better about not shutting them down um, during those combos like that. Who would like to answer that question? So I'll say that, <clears throat> don't take this as gospel, um, but Sometimes scolding and shaming is useful, particularly with friends and family, but be, you know, judicious with it. Um, but I will say what has worked a lot for us is humor. Um, and also not, um, and, and receipts, right? So um, if you know that they are trafficking in misinformation and you can point to a source, um that says like you know that this is like a vast conspiracy that's been pushed out like this is the first time that it was tweeted these are the major people that are pushing it and amplifying it and like the this is what their interest is um so just like that doesn't make sense or that's dumb ad hominem attacks are not helpful but coming up with receipts and um, sources uh, that are reliable and objective, um, I think is super, super helpful. And talking about misinformation and disinformation and, and how it works and again, how um, people are subject to it and getting folks to you know look at the dates of the articles that are posted, et cetera. But again, I think there are times, particularly with people that you know and that where ridicule is necessary Sorry, it is uh, in a relational organizing context, but again, it's in the context of a relationship, right? Um, but when that, when if if that doesn't work, um, humor and consistency, um, and being seen as a as a safe space, uh, like I'm not judging you, but you're wrong, is is a powerful statement and a full statement. Couldn't agree more. Um, Monique, Grata, y'all want to jump in or you want to get the next question? It's up to y'all. Um, I'll just, the only thing I'll add is, um, I, I, not, again, I don't mean to be the Debbie Down or anything, but I know that trust in um, and also the media and also things that are on the internet is also really high uh, or distrust in it or mistrust in it. And so I would say maybe um, a, an, an additional layer to that is thinking about like who are the other people that are in that network of, of like your family. And so, and who is the person that maybe they would listen to a little bit more 
that's that's the only thing I'll add. Thank you, Greta. No, okay, gotcha. Okay, I well, like Sarah's well. suggestion also in the chat. Or how would you want to be treated if somebody was questioning your information? I feel like that's super helpful and instructive. I mean, I like to think that I I don't traffic in misinformation, but um, if I did. <laughs> um, I would welcome it if it was a, a person who had solid information was lovingly but firmly like, girl, you're wrong. And here's why. Um, and, you know, if we can laugh at it too, and that makes it a lot easier. Couldn't agree more. If somebody that you trust and that you have a relationship with, you can correct corrective action on just to be in the know and dispel that misinformation. Okay, the second question I'm gonna ask you from the audience is, how do you resolve that healthy tension between needing accountability and structure in voter, voter contact and letting your volunteers have agency? Who wants to jump into that? Greta? I can take the first stab. Um, I think that, so I think this is best, explained narratively, but you know, when I was an organizer, the only metrics I was held accountable to were the number of doors I was knocking, the number of phone calls I was making. And they were like, if you knock X doors, we win the election. But that didn't take account, you know, the conversations I was having. And especially, you know, towards the end of the election when training is out the window, like, you know, I took it into my little like 20 year old head. Like I need to be running between doors. I need to keep these conversations short. If they, I think they're voting for Barack Obama or shorter, if I think they're not, you know, I need to like hit this door number, and, you know, if somebody came in and they were like, you know, oh, I think I'd love to, you know, host a party with all my friends and family, talk about the election, I'd be like, no, just knock these doors. This is the number of doors they've told me I need to knock. And so I think, you know, the, the metrics and structure that we provide really also indicates our values and what we care about. And I was an organizer in Dubuque, Iowa, which is on the eastern side of Iowa. And it used to be this like really, really blue part of Iowa. And now it's pretty red. And I know that that, you know, trend in terms of turning red is partially because of, of organizers like me, like, you know, haven't done the same. We come in, we do a transaction to everybody's point here. We ask for something really quickly. We bounce out and we don't actually do the long-term work. Um, and so then, you know, when I was working for Hillary Clinton, like my job at the very end of the election over the last couple of weeks was to send GOTV texts. And I sent 10 million texts because they said, these are the, you know, people we need to be texting, text them and ask for their vote. And it was this number, you know, this list that we hadn't texted in the election because, heaven forbid, we text them too early and they unsubscribe and then we can't send them that critical GOTV text. And every single person on those texts was responding like, MAGA, Trump, 2020, I'm voting for Trump. And I was like, this is our GOTV list. Is anybody worried about our model? And they were like, no, 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 no. Trust the data, trust us. We're good to send these texts out. And I was like, are we just mobilizing Republicans? And I think, you know, it is so hard, especially the bigger the campaigns get. And like, again, it's so important for me to mention, like, I have a narrow view of all of this working in big statewide or national campaigns. Um, but it's, it, and I think the bigger the campaign becomes, especially from a higher up perch, you know, I had like 300 staff under me. It was so much easier for me to want to say like, I want to be able to know where one of my organizers is doing right now. So it's important the metrics I set for them are the number of phone calls they're making every day and the number of doors they're knocking. And that gives me a sense that they're working hard. But I think there has to be this trust in our volunteers and our staff that, or we need to organize smarter, not just harder. And we need to, you know, organize much more with an idea of like, you know, pushing power down and, and letting people have conversations with themselves. And somebody said it earlier in the chat, like we can't control the response, but we can control how the message and information is being shared. And I think, you know, it is uncomfortable to loosen up metrics. It's uncomfortable to try new metrics, especially, you know, ones that are really difficult to measure, like the number of conversations that are happening. Um, but you're always going to be running a smarter program if you're trying to loosen and trying to train, do a lot of emphasis on training and a lot of emphasis on thinking about, you know, what, what I want to have you do as the final income or final like outcome of this, instead of trying to police every single, you know, second of every single organizer or volunteer's day. And I think that's where the tension comes in. And I think that's where relational is, is facing a really difficult battle with political campaigns right now. Um, it's hard, you know, it's a lot easier to just have an app and say like, also do the app on the side, but we're still going to measure doors and phones. Um, and I think it's, you know, when we start actually figuring out how to measure 
conversations is when I think, you know, you stop having organizers run door to door trying to just have short interactions because we're prioritizing actual conversations. Agreed. Uh, anybody else want to add to it? If not, we'll go to the next question. I would okay. just say that I think that that's a false dichotomy that structure and discipline is actually absolutely necessary and not negotiable for campaigns. You can get loose with it. You can have fun. You can leverage relationships. You can be cool, the cool kids, all of that. But structure, discipline, predictability um, are your best, are your friends when you are running a campaign. Thank you, Inter. Um, So the next question I'm going to ask is because we talked a lot about relational organizing, us not having a lot of control over it, but empowering those in our community to lift up their communities should be a core function of any campaign, any organizing uh, effort, in my opinion. And so I want um, y'all to kind of chime in and tell me what advice would you give someone that feels powerless in that process of relational organizing when as, you know, candidates, organizations, and even running campaigns, they have to know that the power doesn't, is not with us, it's with the community. That is all of the efforts to get them out, but also to learn from them. Um, so what advice would you give someone or a campaign or an organization that feels relational organizing kind of reduces that power, or shrinks that power, um, to help them understand that the power is within the process and the tool that empowers other people to lift up their community? Who would like to go? Anybody? I'll just say this. Um, when I think about the enemies of progress, they often have had more money than us. And um, when I think about conservative Republicans and their campaigns, um, they're often outspending us and that our power is in our people, period. Um, and so how many people can you get excited Can you bring on board? Can you get singing from the same hymnal? Um, and speaking from the same talking points, that things that allow you to build power, to build your people power um, at a regional, a local, regional, county, state, national level um, are things that can help you win. Um, I think that the closer you are, the more that you're able to build feedback loops, mechanisms that you are not sending down edicts from on high, that you have a way for information to get back to you as well from your volunteers, from their networks, from the people that they're talking to, and that you have a way to take action on that, right? So like somebody should have been like, we are turning out Republicans um, or we're turning out Democrats that are voting for Trump or we're turning out white people that are voting for Trump. Like whatever that message is, or whatever that message needed to be that it someone in the feedback loop like should it is getting that and then taking action on top of that and so the things that allow you to listen to the people and take action based off of what the people have told you are priorities and when you know what the people want and they've told you what their priorities are because using relational, the, the best practices from relational organizing, you're listening twice as much as you're talking, you will have better campaigns, you will have better comms, you will have better volunteer recruitment experiences and better have, you'll have better fundraising. Um, yeah. Thank you, Inter. Um, Monique and Greta, I want to open up the space to let y'all chime in. If not, that's fine, but I want to let y'all know that y'all can jump in if you would like. Oh, okay, great. So um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, all of the attendees, I want to thank our esteemed panelists for all their insight and all the information that they provided today about relational organizing. And just know that this week does not stop at this event as this is a full Bill Blue Week um, with the National Democratic Training Committee. And we encourage each and every attendee, each and every panelist to join um, throughout the remainder of the week. And I'll leave with this, that relational organizing is a phenomenal tool and can be really, really effective. But it is also one that you have to plan to 
use. And you have to be overly deliberate in who you're sending, who's sending out the message and what the message is in order to move people. And if it is done and used correctly, it will take less time to motivate and mobilize voters to the polls, which is the ultimate goal as we continue to build power in uh, democratic uh, cities, counties, and states throughout the country. Hi, I'm Lacey Connolly, one of NDTC's trainers. For more political trainings like this, check out traindemocrats.org. Thanks so much for watching.